Now we come to airflow. Airflow has to be one of the single most important yet overlooked parts of the heating or cooling system, no matter when they're being put in. And that's a, that's a shame. Uh, guys like myself that have been in the industry for a long period of time, uh, yet started clear back in the 90s or 80s or before, may have never actually had the proper uh, teaching to learn how to check airflow, uh, to properly learn how to use a blower performance chart or a manometer uh, to aid in their, their diagnostics for airflow. We're going to talk about that right now because I place a, a fundamental core value on this subject. So in looking at airflow, there's a couple of things you got to think about. Uh, first of all, you've got to make sure that the filters are correct. They've got to be the correct filter for the application, the correct size for the application. If, if either of those things is, are wrong, it doesn't matter where you have things set. You may not have the proper airflow no matter how you look at it. You've got to make sure that the, the filters aren't too restrictive. Now, there are some filters that came out in the late 80s, maybe mid 90s. We used to call them Paul Harvey specials. They were washable filters, extremely uh, tightly woven, cross hatch with uh, um, plastic uh, mesh with some foam in between them. They were so restrictive that you could literally take and put uh, a water hose up next to it and nothing would come out the other side, maybe a little drizzle. So you know airflow is not moving through there. Restrictive filters uh, are probably one of the easiest things to correct on the job site that will make the biggest impact on the customer's comfort level. Is the blower wheel clean? Now, Ashray and Energy Star both place uh, a number on the percentage of, a, of, of, of a decrease in airflow on the return side or the supply side as to whether or not it's going to affect the rest of the system. And that's that's 10 percent, a 10 percent restriction on either the supply side or the return side. Both can be affected by the blower wheel can affect the overall efficiency and capacity by up to 50 percent. That is so huge and such an easy thing to to fix and to cure as well. And you think about it, 10 percent. That's a dryer sheet uh, getting stuck in the, in the, the, the filter. Uh, that's a restricted secondary heat exchanger that rests above the, uh, the blower wheel. That's the blower wheel itself, those, those little scoops that have barely a turn on them, getting a little bit stopped up with dust or, or hair. Those things make a huge difference. And if you've got to dismantle that that blower housing, take the motor out of there, take the wheel off the motor and wash it out. And that's going to be the difference for the customer. You've got to take care of that. Is the evaporator clean? We don't have as many evaporator issues now as what we used to because we have a secondary heat exchanger now that rests just above uh, that blower. And so oftentimes the secondary heat exchanger is going to catch all of the junk that used to get caught in the, the evaporator coil. However, Anything that gets past there that's a much smaller particulate like dust uh, and pet dander and things of that nature are going to catch on a nice wet coil. So the evaporator coil can still uh, get dirty. And especially if you're using uh, filters that are the least amount of restriction, which are those fiberglass filters. You know, that's what the manufacturer gets the efficiency ratings with. That's what gives you the best airflow. But that also on the opposite side is the, the least effective on the filtering side of things, but you can't take that into consideration because these furnaces were never meant to filter the air. They're meant to move the air so that we can create a comfort level through our heating and cooling system that's sufficient for the customers and efficient for the home. Are the registers open? Well, think about that. If you're only closing 10%, the average home has somewhere around 25 to 30 registers. That's three registers in a home that are closed. Probably most of the homes that you go in will have registers closed in them. It doesn't take much uh, to create a negative effect uh, in closing those registers. If you're not able to move that air down those runs, uh, that does impact everything else. Now think about it. 
People close off the registers in order to attempt to force the air in a different direction or to a different portion of the house. Okay, true. Now, if that's the case, wouldn't it always work? Well, that's, that's a loaded question. That's a tough one. It depends on the type of blower. Now, if you've got a multi-speed blower, the multi-speed blower doesn't know that you've closed all those registers. It's still trying to push down those runs. And just because you close off those registers doesn't mean the airflow is automatically going to go uh, to a different run, uh, say to the second floor or to uh, the weird bedroom above the closet or, or to the, the new addition that you've put in that never had good airflow. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, the variable speed technology does help in that a little bit, but if you're restricting that airflow by closing the, the registers, you have unintended consequences of doing that with a variable speed blower because once you start restricting that, the amp draw goes up and it starts to cost you some more money. And that's originally why you got that variable speed uh, blower in the first place was one, to push the airflow, of course, but two, to save you money. You no, know, it's only going to save you money if it's in the proper application and restricting it is definitely not the proper application. So look at this blower wheel. I've got a couple of fun pictures here. Uh, this was an actual picture that was taken uh, by one of my good friends uh, in the technical department of a wholesale house. Uh, he goes out to a customer's job site because the customer wanted to claim warranty on an air conditioning system that had a coil that continued to freeze up. They'd gone through a couple of different expansion valves, they pulled the coil out, it's not stopped up. So here's the, the long story short. Customer has an existing furnace. The old air conditioning system wasn't working properly, so the contractor sold them uh, on replacing it and putting in a new uh, air conditioning system. This was a condenser, a coil, line set, expansion valve, all of that. So they get the job done, and when the job is done, the new system is working very similar to what the old system was working like. And that was obviously a problem for the customer. They just got done spending uh, a ton of money uh, with the contractor, and the contractor was at a loss. So they replaced the expansion valve more than one time. And finally, they just wanted warranty on the whole thing, wanted their money back. Uh, they wanted to go with a different brand. Uh, and so the technical advisor gets involved, goes out there. First thing that he looks at is the surroundings, right? What's around that coil? What's around that condenser that could affect the way it operates? You know, and this is just a, it's a different mindset. Some people don't think that way, but the problem isn't always with the mechanical appliance that is showing the problem. Sometimes the problem is, with the surroundings. And so uh, he begins to look at some of the surroundings. And, and one of the, the beginning things, of course, was the filter and the duct work and, and, and all of that. But then he opens up that bottom panel and, and looks at the blower and the blower wheel is completely full of hair. Now look at this thing, that's, that's pretty next level. And so at that point, obviously, the contractor was a little embarrassed. But think about this from a homeowner's perspective. Now, how would you think uh, that that contractor treated you? If that contractor was having problems with the old air conditioner and couldn't get it fixed and replaced it, and the new air conditioner is having the same type of problem, which was freezing up and airflow issues, and then you see this, which uh, directly ties into both of those issues, maybe you're thinking that uh, you got sold a bill, a, a bill of goods and you didn't actually need the air conditioning system in the first place and it was a simple maintenance related issue that could have been solved uh, or that could have solved the problem much less expensive that's a conversation i don't want to have and i'm sure that you don't either here's another fun picture now this is fun for us but it wasn't fun at the time this is just the opposite here we have the technical advisor going out on a job in which the furnace, brand new furnace, kept trip and limit. Nothing that they could do uh, to get this thing to quit trip and limit. Well, it was your standard insula installation in which the furnace was going to be replaced, but not the coil and not the uh, air conditioning system at all. So what they did is they go out there and they strap up the plenum uh, with wire so that way it stays in place as they pull out the furnace underneath. And rather than just stick your head under there and look up to see whether or not 
that coil has stuff that you could clean out of it while it's now wide and wide open. They didn't do that. Uh, they they got ahead of themselves and moved much more quickly than what they should. And instead of finding this mess, uh, what they actually did is just shove the new furnace under there, left that coil where it is, didn't check it out, and built the plenum down to the top of the fur furnace, and then uh, and then ran the furnace. Couldn't figure out why it tripped limit. Well, it couldn't get rid of the airflow. And, and that's, a, that's a big problem. Uh, when you can't get rid of the airflow, you can't get rid of the heat. So um, you've got to think about those things when you're out there. Uh, think about how quickly this problem could have been solved during that installation. Now, sure, it might slow you down for 10, 15 minutes while you clean this thing out, but that's not nearly the amount of time that was spent afterwards in the several trips and also getting the technical department and, and almost the manufacturer involved with the situation and getting egg on your face uh, because in reality, the problem was yours, uh, not the equipment at all. So checking the airflow. And here we are talking about air conditioning systems uh, and checking the airflow. And we hear terms like external static pressure or ESP thrown around all the time. So what does that actually mean? Well, ESP, the external static pressure, basically uh, static is, is a fancy word for resistance, right? So we're looking for resistance external to that furnace. So everything that is before the furnace, including the filter and all the ductwork, and everything that's after the furnace, including the coil and all the ductwork, are all included in this measurement. Now, if you look at where the two white holes are, in this furnace, they could be symbolic of the side of the furnace or the back of the furnace. Uh, you could make those two penetrations uh, actually in different spots. Uh, I've seen people and I, I myself have gone in through the high limit switch, uh, remove the high limit switch. We're not running this on heat or cool. We're only using uh, the, the fan auto speed uh, or potentially just setting up uh, dip switches. Uh, so. Uh, you could go in through the high limit switch, and I've seen people go into the before the blower section with uh, uh, taps that go in through the low voltage side uh, of that cabinet. So there's other places that you could go. The, the, this is symbolic, really, to show you that you have to take a measurement before the blower, and you have to take a measurement after the blower, and that's got to be in the furnace cavity, so it can't be outside of that. So what is that going to actually do? That's going to show you on your manometer, how much resistance is placed on everything after that furnace and before that furnace? How much stress is that blower really under? Because the manufacturers uh, have a specific value that they're looking for. Almost all manufacturers across the board are gonna give you a value of 0.5 inches of static that you're shooting for, okay? But if you look at this chart that we have here, uh, that 0.5 inches of static is, uh, you know, on the right hand side of center. You could actually go up to 0.8 inches of static on this, as well as most other manufacturers that have multi-speed blowers and, and still be within a verifiable range. And, and the idea here is to check the static before the blower and after the blower, add those values together as raw numbers, take them over and uh, to this chart and plot those across the top of the chart. Okay, so we've got 0.5 inches of static and I'm on low speed. Well, I'd have 674 CFM uh, going through that, that air conditioner at that, at that, or that furnace at that time. So that's the kind of value that we're looking at there. Uh, and we're going to explain this a little bit more, but, but really this is in a general sense some of the baseline information that you've got to know in order to properly set up your furnace. So looking at a blower performance chart, uh, this is another version of the blower performance chart in which you see what's called a fan curve. Those two weird lines in all the checkers there are telling you where that fan is operating uh, as far as CFM goes and static goes throughout uh, the, the cycle of that fan operating. Okay, so if you look across the bottom, you see the CFMs. Okay, that is airflow and CFMs. We know most manufacturers want you to set up an air conditioning system to operate at 400 CFM per ton on most 
Some of them are at 350 CFM per ton. Uh, but if you look at the 400 CFM per ton, what that's telling you is a one ton unit would use 400 CFMs, uh, a two ton unit's 800, three, a three ton unit is 1200 CFM, and you're trying to set it up for that value. Okay, so how do you figure out where that actually leads? Well, if you were to use your manometer and stick it in those areas of the furnace that you made the penetrations in before and after the blower, uh, like we just talked about, you'll find a resistance reading. And on that resistance reading, you then take that back to the chart and that chart is going to tell you what the CFM value is for that resistance. Okay, and before we move off of this chart, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, but before we move off this chart, there's something that we really need to address, and that is filters. Okay, the, one of the biggest problems that we have, we go out and we put in a brand new furnace, and that brand new furnace is set up to the nines by the efficiency programs that are out there, by the standards that, that, that the manufacturers give and the industry uh, gives. So we do everything right. When we leave, the customer goes out and buys a $30 really restrictive filter, puts it in place of the one that we have, which is uh, probably going to be either a four inch filter uh, or it's going to be a fiberglass type filter. And they totally change all the dynamics because they've really restricted that, that airflow now. And because they restrict the airflow, the charge isn't going to be adequate. Uh, it's going to change the temperature drop across a coil, it's going to change the delivery to the different rooms of the house, all of that. So how do you explain that to a customer? You know, unfortunately, I don't have a good way that you can do that. However, I do have a suggestion that you can get into your own mind, and this may help you come up with a, a way that you can explain this to a customer. Okay, so bear with me. On the left hand side of this chart that you're looking at, uh, you see numbers going up and down, and that's what's called static pressure. It's measured in inches of water column on a manometer. Now, static pressure is a fancy word for resistance. How, resist, uh, how much resistance is in that duct work? Uh, and that's what you're measuring with your manometer. So going up and down that chart, as you go all the way up to the top and you see the number one, that is one inch of static. In most applications, that is way more than you would ever want, okay? But in this particular example, that's the maximum amount. You can't get any more than that, okay? But at one inch of static, if you were to put a dot right on that line, clear over by one inch of static, how much CFM do you have? You have zero. So at the most amount of resistance, you have the least amount of airflow. Now look at it from the other direction. Go down to the bottom horizontal chart. You see those numbers across the bottom, which is CFM. That's how, how much air is actually moving while that fan is running. The farthest you can go over to the right, uh, it, it, let's just say it's the 2200. Okay, you go over to that 2200, that's, ex that's the fastest this thing is gonna ever run that's taking the blower out of the furnace altogether and setting it out on the floor. It's equally as bad for the motor. It's gonna burn itself out because it's freewheeling, but you get my point. Least amount of resistance, so we got zero resistance, is the highest amount of airflow. So look at it this way. If we put a board, a piece of wood, in the filter box, it's going to catch 100% of all of the pet dander and allergens and dust mites and hair and everything you could think of. It's going to catch all of it. It's a 100% efficient filter. Now, how much air flow is moving through there? Zero, right? So we got a 100% efficient filter, but zero air flow is moving through there. So, so the closer you get to a piece of wood, the more efficient your filter is going to be, but the worse off your airflow is going to be. And your system is only as good as the airflow. And with airflow being the biggest issue uh, in our systems, you want to have as little restriction as possible with that filter. Now, with that being said, that's a hard conversation to have with a the customer. They want the best filter because they want to filter all the stuff out of the air. 
unfortunately, sometimes they're willing to uh, jeopardize their eight or $10,000 install with this equipment on a $30 filter because it's a better filter. These systems were never designed to filter the air. Now, there's a reason you can't go down to, to your local hardware store and get a filter with the same name as your furnace and a one inch filter because those restrictive MERV 11 filters may not be the best thing for your furnace. So you go down to true value, you might not find a Goodman one inch MERV 11 filter. You might not find a carrier MERV 11 one inch filter or a train MERV 11 one inch filter because they weren't designed to be in these systems. These systems get their maximum efficiency by allowing the most amount of airflow to go through there so they move the most amount of air while having it at the right temperature when they're doing it. That helps dehumidify and cool in the summer and heat in the winter time, but it also on a larger scope over the long haul of this system's life, it will preserve that life. It won't be working as hard. It won't sweat in places it's not supposed to sweat. It won't have problems that go unseen for years and years that eventually lead to large expensive problems. So blower performance is a huge, huge factor in everything that we do. So here's a more expanded blower performance chart as far as your static pressure chart. Uh, if you look over to the, to the left, the left shows you the model of the equipment uh, and you have to make sure that you're looking at the right model. Okay, for instance, the one that's up at the top there, the GMH950453BX. It's telling you that you've got your fan speeds set at medium and high. Okay, so your medium is going to be your uh, furnace speed on high, and then your high speed is going to be your air conditioning speed. Is that going to be good for every application? Do you just not set it up after that? And don't need to check it because the manufacturer knows what they're doing? Well, no, that's not the case at all. Uh, you know, that is a very specific uh, setup that's there from the manufacturer and, and the days of leaving it the way the manufacturer has it, okay, those are, those are gone by the wayside. So you have to check it. You have to put your static pressure tubes in there and you have to check everything. Okay, so you check before the blower and you check after the blower. And once you check before and after the blower, then you make your assessments. You add the raw numbers together. Okay, now for those of you mathematicians, that might be a bit of a tough stretch, right? You stick it before the blower, it's sucking, so it's a negative pressure. You stick it in after the blower, it's blowing, so it's a positive pressure. We don't care about the negative and positive. You take the negative and positive, you crinkle it all up and throw it in the floor uh, because we're adding raw numbers. So in this instance, if you measured your static pressure and it was negative 0.4 before the blower and positive 0.4 after the blower, those don't equal zero in this uh, particular example. They equal 0.8. And if you look at our example here on this GMH95, if we had 0.8 inches of static and we were on high speed with this air conditioning system, we'd had 853 CFM. Now, is that the right amount? I don't know. It depends on what size the condensing unit is. Is it a two ton unit? Is it a three ton unit? Is it a five ton unit? Those are what make the difference. 400 CFM per ton. Now, what I like to do is when a, when a system is brand new and I'm installing it for the very first time, I like to check the static pressure on each of those fan speeds and write it next to the fan speed. So that way, one, Later on, somebody knows that it was done. And they see the values, they see the work done, they see the penetrations, they know that I did my job. Two, it allows me to come back and make adjustments knowing what those static measurements are. I can quickly see all the CFM values that correlate to the static measurements. Now think about it. You've got 0.8 inches of static on your high speed. Chances are going from high to medium you're gonna be probably somewhere closer or in between the 0.7 and 0.8, okay? So let's say it drops down to 0.7. Well, check that out. At 0.8 on high speed, it was 853 CFM. 
but uh, at 0.7 on medium speed, it's seven or it's 859. It's actually six CFM higher on medium speed because of the change in the resistance in the ductwork. Now you go to medium low, chances are between medium and medium low, you probably won't drop uh, to another static level. So it'll probably stay right in that same uh, guideline there. So you probably drop down to maybe around 741 in this instance. And then once you drop down to the low speed, you're going to be at that 620 CFM range. Hey, and those are examples. Uh, those are not standard by any means. Uh, you know, there is no such thing as standard. Every install is different. Every piece of duct work in every home is a little bit different. Now think about this. Okay, I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to tell you something and, and it's going to correlate to heating and I think you'll get it. Right, this is how critical it is that we set these up. In the past, some of the older furnaces that we put in had an air temperature rise nearly 100 degrees. Okay, now you take the same BTU value in today's furnaces, our air temperature rise, according to many of the efficiency uh, tests and, and, and setup charts, they want you to be somewhere around the 50 degree temperature rise uh, setting. Okay, now the manufacturer has on their tag 35 to 65 or 30 to 60. Okay, but that's a that's a an operating range that's safe to operate that piece of equipment. That doesn't tell you anything about efficiency or anything like that. You still got to set it up. Okay, so older furnaces had a temperature rise of around 100 degrees. Newer furnaces of the same BTU value uh, are supposed to be set up around 50 degrees. So what changed? We went from 100 degrees temp rise on the old one to 50 degree temp rise on the new ones, a ton more airflow. That's what we've got to move is a ton more airflow. So the older ductwork that's in the homes oftentimes is not sized correctly for the modern equipment. It was sized to move less airflow. So we're already starting off uh, with, a, with our hands tied on the ductwork because usually it's all in finished ceilings and walls and floors and things like that. So we have to do what we can to make the airflow right in the home. And what we can do is one, make sure that the filter is sized properly and also make sure that it's not restrictive. The fiberglass filters, although nobody likes to use them because, well, you can hold it up like this and see right straight through it. And it's not going to catch much except for the big stuff. When you start putting more restrictive stuff in there, then it starts to cut into your airflow and mess everything up. So we can, we can control the filter. We can control the filter both in size and restriction. We can control the return air drop. Uh, one of the biggest things that I see as an issue in our industry are the return air drops. 20 years ago, one of the more common filter sizes was a 16 by 20. And there aren't very many manufacturers nowadays that will allow you to use anything smaller than a 16 by 25, up to 70,000 BTUs. Once you get above 70,000 BTUs or at 70,000 BTUs, well, then you really need to jump up to a 20 by 25 filter. And then at 90,000 BTUs, you need to have a base with a 20 by 25 opening, or you have to have the weird dual side return uh, in there, which always looks a little bit odd. Uh, but you've got to make sure that you have adequate uh, return air. And that's one of the easiest things for, for us to cure uh, is a return air side. Now, that doesn't count. Uh, putting in more return air registers upstairs uh, as being easy. I'm talking about what's in the actual mechanical room. And the last thing uh, that usually is something that's fairly simple for us to cure is going to be uh, the collars. At 20 years ago, you had a lot more dedicated sheet metal workers. And those tinners were very, very good at their craft. And I'm not saying we don't have them now, but the price of prefabbed metal has come down so much that a lot of times, instead of making some of the uh, the easier, smaller parts out in the field, they'll, they'll go buy a box of them. And so they have them on their van. So it, it doesn't really, uh, you know, it's not really cost effective to make them like it used to be. Now, 20 years ago, if you had to put a collar on for a run that's coming off the ductwork, the tenor would go ahead and just fabricate that right there on the job. And it would just take him a few minutes to do so. But oftentimes it wasn't going to be an offset. Right, so the offset 
comes off of the duct work in a slope, right? So it slopes up and then out uh, on your trunk lines. A lot of times in the old days, what they would do is they'd fabricate one that was a right angle, right? Just a nice square collar, which served the purpose just fine. We had less airflow back then, so we didn't have as much of an issue with the duct restriction that we do now. So to sum it up on what we can fix and what we can, what we can do uh, with our ducted systems to provide better airflow is one, you go out there and you look at a job and you're bidding a job and you're putting in new equipment or even on a service and check, look at the return airdrop. You can get a lot of information from the return airdrop. Is it physically sized right? Is it big enough uh, for the return air on the new equipment? Uh, do we have adequate filter space? Uh, meaning, is it at least 16 by 25 or bigger? Uh, now, with that being said, are we doing a four inch filter? If we're doing four inch filters, four inch filters have more surface area. So usually uh, they lend themselves to better um, pressure drops and they're not as restrictive as the one inch filter. So if you have to have something that's a little bit better filter, you know, instead of going with the one inch filter, which has very little surface area and is highly restrictive, you'd be better off to go with a four inch filter that has more surface area and, and less of a, a restriction in the system. Uh, now, you're still gonna have to change it every, every couple of months. Uh, so it's gonna cost you still you know, 20, 30 bucks to do so, but it will filter the air better and you'll not bite into your airflow as much as a, as a one inch filter will. So, so back on track, we got the return air drop. Is it sized properly? Do we have the right filter in there? And, and after that, do we have uh, straight collars or do we have offset or transitions? You know, how, how is our duct work coming off on our trunk runs? If they're straight collars, we can fix that easy. We can put in um, offsets. And then lastly, make sure that everything is set up properly. You know, do we have a blower? Uh, is our blower set up the way that it should be? Do we have the right dip switches selected uh, on a variable speed or ECM blower? Uh, and then in addition to that, do we have the right CFMs on a multi-speed blower for the amount of tonnage that we have uh, on this equipment? Here's your example. If you look at this, we had 0.7 inches of static on high fan speed, 0.5 inches of static, taking your measurement, of course, before the blower and after the blower, adding those together, that came up to 0.7. You go over to this chart, 0.7 equal 955 uh, CFM. Okay, so that is a, a direct value that is very easy uh, to measure and then also to manipulate because you can change your fan speed to one lower than that uh, very easily. You just change the speed tabs on the blower. Uh, looking at the CFMs, again, uh, when you're taking your CFM static measurements, you're, you're, you're dropping the negative and the positive off and you're adding just the raw number. So like I said, Negative 0.4 and positive 0.4, uh, traditionally in mathematics, that would equal zero. Uh, but in what we're talking about, you're taking the negative and positive, throwing it on the floor and adding the raw negative or the raw numbers, which would be 0.8 in this uh, particular instance. Your fan speeds, traditionally, as we were just looking at on the manufacturer's guidelines uh, that I just had pulled up there a minute ago, uh, you had four fan speeds. You had the high, you had the medium, then you had medium low, and then you had low. Okay, so if you look at this board, you've got a spot for your high heat, your cool, your low heat, and then there's two up in the top left-hand corner. They're called park. Park is not energized. It's a place for you to put any spare fan speeds that you don't want energized, and it's in lieu of the way we used to do things. The way we used to do things was to just tape it up and leave it hang or, or strap it to another bundle of wires. Okay, now you just run that to the board and that's an unenergized terminal. One thing that you'll find out that once you start actually checking your blower speeds is that your high heat and your cool speed will usually be very, very, very close to the same speed and oftentimes will be the same speed. Uh, it's not the traditional way we used to do things. Traditionally, 
High was, was always cooling, low was always heating. Now they're pretty pretty close to the same in most applications. And, and that's that's because nowadays we're doing load calculations and the load calculations uh, are, are very precise on BTUs uh, for, for loss and gain uh, on both heating and cooling side. And, and so um, it's an interesting thing once you get Chuck uh, to, to starting checking these things. Now, I told you also that one of the things that I like to do is check all the fan speeds uh, really before I, I begin my setup. Uh, checking all the fan speeds on a multi-speed blower with a board such as the one that we're looking at right now is very simple. Uh, the cool terminal on there is what's directly connected to the fan on switch on the thermostat. So if I connected the fan on switch or I jumped out the R and the G on the board, it would turn on the speed that's on that cool terminal. So as you might guess, what I will do is I'll put my, my manometer in uh, those two penetrations, the one below, before the blower, the one after the blower, and I will go from one fan speed, turn it on, write down the, the static measurement, pull it off and swap it out with another one on the cool, and then I will go to that one and then write it down, and then I'll swap it out with a different one yet, and I'll go from one to the other on that cool terminal, uh, turning the fan speed on, uh, so that way it's very, very quick. I'm not using heat or I'm not using cool. Uh, I'm just looking at the raw values for the static and the ductwork. It's all I'm looking for uh, so I can properly set up that blower. Okay, and there's a little bit closer uh, look at what we're talking about. Okay, this one's a little bit different uh, because here we actually have a control board for a more advanced uh, system that has an ECM motor or a variable speed motor. And you can see on the left-hand diagram out of the manufacturer's installation instructions, there's some switch banks there. Uh, and ironically, the way that those are labeled is S1, S2, S3, those are switch banks. And they don't necessarily always work out that way. As you look at the actual control board that I took a picture of here on the right-hand side, if you look close in the upper left-hand corner of each of those switch banks, they're not in order. The one at the very top, spaced away from the other three, is S3, so switch bank three. Uh, then after that comes switch bank four, and then five, and the one very, very lowest uh, on that totem pole is switch bank one. Now you can see that those, switch, those switches on those switch banks, they go uh, in one position to the other position. One side's on, one side's off, and different configurations of on and off give you different values and programming for how the controls in the rest of that furnace operate, particularly in this case uh, for our variable speed motor. Okay, here's a, an example of the manufacturer's diagrams on how to adjust the blower speed. Okay, if you look at the switch banks at the top, we got switch banks one, two, and three. And if you look at the cooling selections here uh, on the little breakaway chart, uh, just off of the uh, left-hand side of where I am, uh, which is right over here, you'll see the cooling selections. And they tell you uh, whichever size blower you've got, uh, that's gonna be the corresponding uh, CFMs for your configuration of dip switches. Okay, so if you've got the 56,000 uh, or the 70,000 BTU furnace, then you're going to have a half horse blower and your configurations of switch, uh, switch bank one, uh, dip switch number four, and dip switch number five, both in the off position, will be 1,050 CFM. But if you had the larger size furnaces, the 84,000 and 98,000 BTU furnaces, then you're going to have the, quarter, uh, the three quarter horse uh, blower and that same uh, configuration of dip switches, switch bank one, dip switches number four and five, uh, will then equal 1750 CFM. Okay, so you have to make sure that uh, you've got the right blower that you're looking at here as far as your terminal settings uh, and when you set up your, your dip switches for an, an ACM motor. Now, it's not rocket science. Uh, and some people set these up and they say, well, how do I know that it's actually achieving that? Okay, well, here's a secret. These things are pre-programmed 
to achieve the CFM value that you set them at as long as you're less than one inch of static. So that control module that's on the end of that motor will maintain that 1050 CFMs uh, on the off-off uh, configuration for the half horsepower blower unless you go over one inch of static. Okay, so your measurement before the blower and after the blower has to be less than one inch of static in order to maintain that 1050. Now, once you get up above that one inch of static, it goes all over the place. It's just, uh, you can't say that it goes down, it goes up. It, it's kind of a, a mixed bag. But one thing's for sure, the, the farther away that you can keep it from one inch of static, the better off you are. Now, think about it. Okay, you've got a motor with a computer module at the end of it. And that motor with a computer module at the end of it is consistently trying to fight the resistance in that ductwork. And the way that it does that is it's changing its configurations internally to increase the amount of torque that it can exert against that, that resistance. In doing so, the amp draw goes through the roof. So you've got a motor that's extremely efficient as long as it's in the application that it was designed for, which is one inch of static or less. And according to manufacturer specs, 0.5 inches of static or less. If you put it in that application, it will run much more efficiently than its counterpart in multi-speed blowers. And again, here's your blower chart. Uh, you, your blower chart that we just spoke about uh, a second ago, not a lot of rocket science here. I didn't, I did want to make sure uh, that we got one more look at it so that everything was crystal clear. Okay, so things you need to look at. You got your correct model number okay, over on the far left hand side here. You're on X fan speed and that X fan speed correlates to your resistance across the top, right? Your static. Uh, so that would be the 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Okay, that's your measurement of before blower and after the blower and you add the raw numbers. Okay, once you figure out what those are for each fan speed, you go to that static resistance, go down the column, match it up with its corresponding CFM value and set up your blower according to 400 CFM per ton for this manufacturer uh, and for most manufacturers uh, or 350 for just but a few of them. But know what the manufacturer actually wants and set up that blower speed according to that. If you don't do that, what happens? If you don't set up your blower speed properly, well then what? I'll be honest with you, I went over a decade not understanding any of this stuff. So what happens? What happens to those air conditioning systems? Well, almost every one that comes from the manufacturer has high speed as your air conditioning speed. Okay, so if high speed is your air conditioning speed, and that's way more uh, CFMs or, or airflow than what the system actually needs, what happens is it makes your coil too warm. It takes the, the cool away from your coil too quickly, so you don't get good de dehumidification, you don't get a good air temperature rise, or I'm sorry, air temperature drop across that coil. So what you do, instead of lowering the blower speed like you should to the correct CFM value, you go out and you add refrigerant to the system outside. And when you add refrigerant, it fills that coil a little bit more and creates a little bit better temp drop Never perfect, but in doing so, it gets it to the point to where it's working fairly well, but over the long haul, here's what happens. It doesn't dehumidify properly. You've now overcharged the system, so it's not running efficiently. You've, you've ruined some of the capacity, some of the efficiency. The compressor is not running, electrically speaking, as efficient as it should. Uh, it's gonna draw more amps on startup, so the likelihood of it tripping a breaker or blinking the lights is, is much higher than what it would be if you'd have just done it the way that you should have done it. And all around, those things are going to probably add up to a system that dies or has a failure rate well before its time. And, and, and the best case scenario, you're gonna have a system that is gonna cost the customer a bunch of money 
over a long period of time because it's not running as efficiently as it should and it doesn't have the capacity to now cool the entire structure the way that it should so it it always will struggle okay so here's another little secret those problems only show up in extremes you ever wonder why it gets so so busy when it's 95 degrees but when it's 87 degrees or 85 degrees it's not really all that busy at all well because at 85 degrees you turn a box fan on in your in your room a box fan feels pretty good you can cool uh, a home that's at 85 degrees at least enough to make the customer or yourself feel like everything's working the way that it should the wheels are all spinning uh, you know, and, and not enough to complain, certainly, but once you get up above the 90s, into that 95 degree plus range, all the little things that you didn't do correctly when you were out there servicing it or initially installing it, that's when those things show up. The extremities, your furnace problems always show up at below freezing. Your air conditioning problems always show up in the 90s and above because that's when all of those problems are exposed. When it's 90 some degrees uh, in, in the Midwest, it's also really, really humid. At 85, sometimes people still have their windows open and you get a nice breeze across the house. But at 95 degrees and humidity uh, added into that mix, it feels like it's into the hundreds. So if you're not dehumidifying properly, because it's not charged properly and the airflow is not set properly, that sticks out. And then you run into a situation where maybe you have some cool air, but it's cool and it's, it's uh, uh, clammy. So it's a little moist, it's not dehumidifying. You run into kind of a funky smell uh, as well. My name is Corey Paper. We're gonna go over the adjustment of a blower in a gas furnace. And in doing that, what I focused on is how simply changing the blower speed to set it up properly for the manufacturer's guidelines to make sure that you've got the proper CFMs going across this coil for air conditioning and across this heat exchanger for heating makes all the difference in the world. Now traditionally we have always been told or have assumed some of the old school guys like myself it comes on high from the manufacturer for air conditioning speed it comes on low from the manufacturer for for heating speed we just leave it there and and that's not the way that we are supposed to do it. it's not the way we're ever supposed to do it and so that is why I'm going over this it's a very simple process uh, it's called checking external static pressure or ESP uh, static pressure is just a fancy name for resistance to the ductwork and that's what we're checking and some people can make it very complicated, other people can make it uh, as simple as, as it could possibly be. For me, uh, I have a pretty simple method for checking that. Okay, first of all, uh, you've got to take your measurement with a manometer before the blower and after the blower. Okay, some will say after the, uh, the filter and before the coil, that's the same thing. The main thing is you don't want to take it before the filter and after the coil because the filter and the coil oftentimes are your most restrictive devices inside of that ductwork so you want to make sure that you're compensated for those by looking to see what they're actually drawing as far as resistance in this system so uh, in setting up your blower speed we can see we've got a manometer right here which is hooked up inside set that up here for a moment off this bottom door and I have removed the blower speed taps to make it quick and simple off of the board okay so we've got several different areas where things hook up on this board but what we're most interested in on this particular setup where we've got a multi-speed blower not a variable speed there's no computer modulating system on the end but just a regular multi-speed blower we're going to change the speed taps which will change the speeds if you'll notice right on 
the back of the data plate, we actually have the different speeds and the colors that correspond with those. We've got black is your high speed, blue is your medium speed, orange is your medium low speed, and then red is going to be your low speed. Now what we're trying to figure out is which of those speeds is going to be the proper setup for this furnace for the air conditioning speed. Now in doing that, we have to make sure that we set everything up properly according to the manufacturer's guidelines. And the manufacturer's guidelines tell us that we've got to make sure it's set it up according to the blower performance data, like you see on this chart. The particular furnace that we're working with is GMH9545. You can see it says high, medium, and low speed. We looked at the colors just a second ago uh, so that we were adept at looking inside of the bottom of this blower compartment and seeing those colors. Across the top here is your actual static measurement, and that static measurement is going to correspond to an airflow noticed right below, CFM. What we're trying to do is set this up properly for the manufacturer. Down at the bottom, it actually tells us in order to be set up properly for this manufacturer, we want 400 CFM per ton for cooling for this setup. So we're going to try to find that. But right now, I have already set this up. So I know that we're set up for the proper blower speed right now as it sits. As you'll notice we've got the orange wire in here. The orange wire is actually the wire that we're using and it's low speed and that's because I've already measured this. I have my manometer already hooked up. I'm going to go ahead and put in a regular old filter okay, and these fiberglass filters are the ones that we're supposed to be using in a furnace even though most people use the Merv 11s or or something like that, the manufacturer uses the fiberglass filters. So on this medium low blower speed, we'll notice that once we're hooked up and we've got the right filter in there, and our doors put back on, that we'll achieve a certain amount of static that's going to get us in range because I have tested it. Okay, now normally what I would do is I would start on high speed. I would go through from high speed all the way to low speed. And I would set up each of those statics, write down each of those statics in the installation guidelines. But I want you to see firsthand what it looks like when we've got the proper airflow on a manometer. Okay, so I've just turned it to on should kick on in just a moment and as it does you should see somewhere within range on here what the value uh, we're looking for is okay so immediately it pops right up to where it's going to operate at we're at about 0 0.51 0 0.52 you round that down to uh, the next or the closest number just like uh, anything else. So we're going to round that down to 0.5. If you look at the installation guidelines for the system that we're working on, we're on medium low, 0.5 inches of water column, gives us 884 for our value for CFMs. We've got a two ton system we're working with, and as the manufacturer specified, we're looking for 400 CFM per ton. Two tons at 400 CFM per ton would give us 800 CFMs. So we're right at that value we need to be at. But one thing that we could do to possibly mess that up just a slight amount is put in a more restrictive filter. I know most people use pleated filters. You gotta remember the pleated filters are not designed for these systems. There's a reason you can't go down to your local hardware store and get a filter that's designed by the manufacturer that made your system.
But as you can see, that definitely made an impact on our manometer. We went up a little bit. Now remember, this filter is brand new. There's no dirt on it. As it gets dirty, the more restrictive it's going to get. And it'll get dirty quicker. The fiberglass filters that we were just looking at won't hardly catch enough stuff that it'll get stopped up within the 30-day time frame that you're going to leave that thing in there with. Okay, so we're going to go ahead, take this filter out that we just put in there. We're going to put the fiberglass back in there. We're going to change our blower speed. So when changing our blower speed, we're going to get inside of this blower compartment again. Wait for this blower to kick off. Once it kicks off, we're going to go right back up to that high speed that traditionally is where a lot of us have these already set up. I'm going to go ahead and take it off that medium low which is where we know now that it's supposed to be set up. Okay, so now we have our fan back on. With our fan back on, we can see that high speed has jumped this all the way up to just over 0.6. Right, 0 0.63, 0 0.62, somewhere around in there. What does that mean on our CFM? Because that's traditionally where the manufacturer would have left this, would be on high speed. That would, that would be the manufacturer factory setting. So in looking at this, what would high speed have meant? Well, high speed at 0 0.6 inches of static would be 1,044 CFM way too much airflow for what we're looking for. So that amount of airflow would mean that we wouldn't get the right amount of cooling for what we're looking for. We've got to have somewhere around 800 CFM per ton. So that 800 CFM per ton is super important. If we left it on high speed and went in and checked our our temp drop across the coil, we would notice our temp drop across the coil wasn't very good. We would also notice when we're checking our charge that our, our superheater subcooling would be off depending on the type of metering device that we've got. So we would have to go back and adjust the charge to compensate for the poor amount of airflow. And all we've talked about here is setting up the blower. If the blower's not set up right, nothing else will function correctly. We still have to have the proper size filter. We have to have the proper type of filter. Our charge has to be good. Our ducts have to be clear and open. We have to have enough return air. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this. But it all starts with the blower. If the blower is set up properly, you can work with everything else.